Well, hello again, everybody. I, uh, I have these moments in my history that, that seemingly changed everything, and they're, and they're moments when you know they're, uh, that are going to change everything, right? Like, if you can think back to your high school graduation or your last day of high school, <coughs> uh, and, and you just had this sense, right? Like, like, when this is concluded, when this is over, then, then everything is going to be different moving forward. I, uh, yeah, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that it's going to be different than it's always been. I, I know marriage is like that, right? Like, uh, it's, it's like this switch, and, and all of a sudden you go from this person who's not been married to this person who is, and the responsibilities change, and uh, the expectations change, and how you spend your time changes. I mean, it's like it totally, you know, causes life to do maybe not a 180, but a, a big turn, right? Everything becomes very different. I think in my own life about <coughs> becoming the pastor of this church, and I don't know if I knew then, but uh, but if I could look back and tell myself, it's going to change, you know? It's going to change the way people view you. It's going to change, you know, your workload. It's going to change your responsibilities. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change you and the things that you deal with. I know for me, the birth of my children, especially our first Hazel, uh, it, it was this, I, I, I saw it then, right? All of a sudden, baby comes out, and, and then they're like handing it to you, and it's like, oh, this, you know, like, what do I do with this? How's this going to work out for me? And, and, and if your life doesn't change in, in these moments, then, then it's kind of weird, right? Like, if, if you graduate from high school and you show up the next year, it's not good. Nobody's going to like that. And if you get married and keep hanging out with the other ladies, you know, like, nobody's going to be okay with that. And if you're a pastor and you don't act like it, that's no good. And if you have kids and you keep living your normal life, then you're a bad parent. And, and so these, these moments, these, these moments, and we all have them, and and you probably have ones that are unique to you, not just generic like some of the, the things I've just listed. Uh, they, they change, you know, the trajectory and the course and the history of, of our entire lives. And, and I just would ask the question today, I guess. I, I know this is going to be weird, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to work it out for you. But do you ever think about Christmas like that? Like, like it's a moment that changed, you know, history, but it also is a moment that that change your entire life. Because Mary does. And, and Mary doesn't just see it as a moment. Mary, Jesus, Mom, she doesn't just see this, this thing called Christmas as a, a moment that changes her life, as we'll see in a few moments this morning. She sees it as a moment that changes your life and changes all of our lives, that change, changed the, the course of, of history. And the way that she sees this, I think, is something that all of us need to embrace because I know you think like, well, you know, Jesus' birth, it changed history because there's churches and, you know, eventually he would die and all that. But, but it's something so, I think, particular about Jesus coming that should change the way that, that we view God and that we view ourselves and that we view the world and, and really uh, maybe everything. Uh, here, here's what I, uh, the proposition for this morning is. Here's what I think kind of the point is of, of Mary and what she says in this song that she is singing that we're studying through the, uh, the month of, of December. Uh, here, here's what I believe this says. Christmas turns pressed into from now on blessed. Christmas turns pressed into from now on blessed. And that's exactly what we're gonna see in her words this morning. Here's how she begins in Luke 1.48. She says, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Now, if you remember back to last week, if you weren't here, you won't remember, but if, let me catch you up speed. And, and for those of you that were, let me remind you, Mary's response to the incredible pressure that's been brought upon her by, by God conceiving in her the, the son of God, Jesus, her response to the pressure that would come with all of that was to turn her eyes to God and say, it is now my goal, my hope, uh, my aim to magnify you, God, and to rejoice in the work that you have done. And I said last week that needs to be our goal during the Christmas season and in all seasons. Our goal should be to magnify God and to celebrate, to rejoice in the work that he has done in our lives, especially as we think about Christmas. My rhyme was this, trepidation turns celebra to celebration 
when God receives our adoration. Mary, Mary's attention upon conceiving the Son of God, this thing that, that had to incite fear and worry and stress and you know all kinds of struggle mentally, but her, her main response is to turn her attention to God and say, I adore you, I wanna worship you, I wanna praise you, I wanna make you look great, I wanna show the world that you are great is a better way to say it. And here in our verse this morning, Mary explains why she responds in such a way. I think that's really important to, to, to know that information, right? I mean, why did this young girl facing all of this stress, all of this pressure, respond with a heart to adore God? Now, to understand what she says in this verse that I've already read, you need to understand that, that Mary was a, a devout Jewish girl. She loved God. I think that's part of the reason that God chose her to bear his son. And, and, and she would have, it seems, by this, this song that she's singing at least, she knew the scriptures very well. And I like to picture Mary as this young girl, partly because I like to think that my daughter will be this way, as this young girl who looked at the, the women in the Old Testament and just saw them as heroes, which they are heroes. They are heroes. And I just like to think about Mary as she finds out from an angel that she is now pregnant with the Son of God and, and trying to figure out, what do I do with this? How do, I, how do I put this in some kind of perspective that makes sense? Turning to the heroes of her past and trying to figure out what exactly she was experiencing through the lens of these great saints who had experienced things for God and with God. And Mary seemingly turns her attention most specifically to Hannah. Hannah was a woman who, who was having trouble uh, conceiving a child, uh, becoming pregnant, and, and she goes to the temple and she prays and she, she says, God, if you'll give me a, a child, if you'll give me a son, I, I promise I'll devote his life to you entirely. And what she meant by that is she's gonna bring him back to the temple and literally give him over for service once he is old enough to do that for the service of God in the temple. And, and at, in this first, this first thing she says in verse 48, that God has been mindful of the humble state of her servant, it's just an echo of Hannah's prayer once she becomes pregnant. In 1 Samuel 2, 1, it says, my heart rejoices in the Lord, and the Lord, my horn is lifted high. It's clear that one of the things that Mary draws from Hannah's prayer is, is this idea that runs throughout all of Hannah's prayer, and that is that God looks at the lowly. God looks at the disenfranchised. God looks at the lesser of the world, those who have been broken and hurt by, by what this world does. We all know how the world can tear us down. He looks at those people, and it's his desire to lift them up. And Mary knows Hannah's prayer and, and pulls from Hannah's prayer. And in it, she looks at herself and she says, this is exactly what God has done for me. He has seen the lowly state of me, his servant, and he has raised me up in the coming of this child. Uh, this is how we should view Christmas too. Uh, we're gonna talk more about this in a moment, but but we should view Christmas as God coming to lift us up from our low estate, from our low place. I think that all of us have things that make us feel like lesser, right? Like we all have things that make us feel downtrodden, like, like God, you know, do you really understand? How come you let this be a part of my life? Why didn't you make me more like them? Why didn't my circumstances go more like theirs? And, and I think each of us in some way, we look at our situation and, and we think, man, it could be better if God just would have. And Christmas is a story about God doing something to take you from your low position and, and, and then to raise, to raise you up, to raise you up. Now, what she means by, by this idea of, uh, of God being mindful, we'll come back to. What does it mean for God to see us in our low place and raise us up? We'll come back to that in the thing she says next. But first, I want you to know two things. First, just this. If you're in a humble place this Christmas, you're in a great place this Christmas. I mean, if you're looking at your financial situation, if you're looking at, 
You know, the, how family members don't like you or that maybe, and I hope this is not true for any of you, but you don't have anybody to celebrate Christmas with. If you're, if you're in that situation, you think this is really bad, then, then I think that, that Christmas says actually that's a great place to be because you, like Mary, can celebrate in a different way as you recognize that this Christmas story is all about taking you from your low place and raising you up. But here's this other thing that, that's so important is it, and it connects to that. I mean, she says that God has been mindful of her. Simply means to look upon. God's looked at me. He's paid attention to me. What an incredible thought, right? Just that. Don't you feel like God doesn't care, like he doesn't see, like he's not paying attention sometimes? Don't you just, just have moments and situations and circumstances that you just are like, I don't know, God, like if you were paying attention, wouldn't you do something about this? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you help? Wouldn't you be there for me? And, and, and the Christmas story, it's, and what Mary does in response to the Christmas story is saying, God does pay attention to you. That's why this story exists. No matter what you're facing, your financial situation, your relationships, your struggles in retail, I mean, whatever, whatever it is that you are facing, the Christmas story stands there as a reminder that God absolutely is mindful of you. He is paying attention to you. He is looking at you. He cares about you. And maybe you don't see answers to your prayers, right? And you go, I just, God, if you would answer my prayer. And it's easy in those moments to say, if you would answer my prayer, then I'd believe in you. If you'd answer my prayer, then you know, I'd serve you better. If you'd answer my prayer, then, then I'd start living for you again. But we need to erase those excuses and say, well, in the story of Christmas, we see that God does care. And no matter what he allows to happen to us, the Christmas story stands to say that God is paying attention to you and your circumstances. I would say the entire gospel is a story about this very thing, God paying attention to us in some ways, right? I mean, if God wasn't paying attention, then Jesus never would have come. And if God wasn't paying attention, then Jesus never would have died for our sins on a cross and if God wasn't paying attention then you know the resurrection would not have been important but God was paying attention and he looked down from heaven and he said I see these people stuck enslaved by their sin and, and what I want to do for them is I want to save them and so so Jesus came in order to live and die and rise again so that you might be saved from your sin you might have forgiveness for your sins it's all a story of God paying attention to us and saying, I'm gonna do something for you. But Mary recognizes so brilliantly right from the beginning that even in the conception, we can see that God cares about us when we are struggling, when we are downtrodden, when we are hurting, when we are broken. I love what John Piper says because it's such a good reminder about this. He says the only people whose soul can truly magnify the Lord are people like Elizabeth and Mary who acknowledge their lowly state and are overwhelmed by the condescension of the magnificent God. And he doesn't mean like God's been condescending, condescending towards us. He means that God has stepped down from his high place into our low place because he cares so much about us. And the reality that he gets to here is it's hard during Christmas or any season to, to really celebrate the coming of Jesus if we don't view ourselves like Mary viewed herself in a humble state in need desperately of God to intervene in our lives. But if we view ourselves that way, th then the Christmas story becomes a story to celebrate joyfully because we recognize that this was the moment when God said, yeah, I'm coming. I, I love the line from the song, Oh Holy Night, Long Lay the World in Sin and Air Pining. When we were pining in our air and our sin, we could not break free from it. We were stuck completely and utterly in fact, and this is so fascinating to me, before the coming of Jesus, the world lay just waiting to hear from God for some 400 years. There's no written record of God's work in humanity's life. And so they were really like, God, do you, do you hear us? Do you care about us? Are you paying attention? And then Mary becomes pregnant 
with the Son of God? And the answer is from heaven, a resounding yes. A resounding yes. But in order to receive that gift truly, in order to really celebrate it, we must be like Mary. And Luke one thirty eight, Mary said the same thing. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. She says this right after the angel says, hey, you're going to be pregnant with the Son of God. It's gonna be miraculous. It would have been easy for her to like just start saying like, what, this is stupid. I'm seeing things, this is hallucination, I don't know what's going on. But instead, Mary looks at the angel and says, I am the Lord's servant. And now, as she sings this song to God, she returns to that, I am the Lord's servant. Two reasons this is important. First, that word servant is a word that is consistently used for all of God's people in the Old Testament. The reality is that this single word opens up all that is happening to Mary and the benefits that she receives by becoming the mother of God to each and every one of us. We can all become part of the family of God. And as she uses this word servant, it's as if she is inviting all people who will give their lives to God into her story, but more importantly, into God's story. All people can now be part of the family of God because because God has looked down, seen us in our lowly state, state and brought Jesus into the world but the other reason that that's important that word servant is that it's a word that means something like slave I mean it is a word for complete servitude and the reality is that each of us need to make a decision if we are going to give our lives to Jesus or not. The coming of Jesus is not effectual for the people who do not choose to trade their low life for the high life of God. It is not effectual for people who do not choose to become God's servants. Now Jesus came so that every one of us could be lifted from our low place into a higher place. All of us could come into the family of God, but it only matters, it will only be true for people who look at God and say, I will be your servant. I will give you my life. All those things that I said about Jesus coming and dying and rising again, if we're going to take the gift of Christmas and really have it apply to our lives, then we must believe that story to be true. And then we must say, I trade God my old life for a new life in you. I give you my life. I'll be your servant. I'll follow you wherever it may lead. Mary says, look, (laughs) this is important because I'm God's servant. And as God's servant, just a low servant, I know that this conception changes everything. This is a moment that changes everything because I know from now on that God has seen me right where I am and chosen to help me. But what she says next, I think, is more magnificent. I mean, she says, you know, for... He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant, but what has he done for this next thing? From now on, all generations will call me blessed. I want to consider Mary's situation again because I think it's, it's so staggering when you consider what she's living through and the words of this incredible song. Uh, Mary could have been as young as 14 years old. Uh, she was pregnant an angel had told her that she was going to become pregnant and she was still a virgin right she was engaged to be married uh, to a man named Joseph and, and in our and their society engagement held the same commitment level as marriage does for us today and now she's engaged to this man and she's pregnant and she believes I'm sure that she's going to have to go back to this man and say hey I'm pregnant and she's going to have to say in truth I'm pregnant by the power of God and he's going to probably in her head look at her and go you're crazy and you're an adulterer and so therefore I reject you he may very well publicly shame her and put her out in front of the world and say look what she has done this is not my child but even if he didn't do that then he was going to divorce her as a righteous person And she was going to spend the rest of her time raising this baby, probably begging for food because she would not be taken in by her family any longer, maybe. And she would not be able to get a job. Women didn't work like that in their society. And this is her situation. She's got to be thinking about all of this. And in the midst of that, she says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Blessed is this 
Uh, the verb form of this word makarios that if you've been at this church any amount of time know is my favorite word in the entire New Testament. It's the word that Jesus uses in what's called the Beatitudes when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit and go down the line there, all of those things. But it's a word that sometimes is translated happiness and it's a horrible translation. Uh, because the word means something very different than happiness. Happiness is fleeting, right? Like, I'm happy when the Cowboys win, and I'm not happy when the Cowboys don't. Likewise, I'm happy when the Blazers win, and I'm not happy when the Cowboys don't. (laughs) This word means something far greater than that. Uh, This word is, interestingly, a word that was used for the happiness of the gods in Greek culture. By that, they meant that the gods had unlimited resources and an unlimited ability to use those resources. In the past, I've I've described it through this, just the idea of cake. I like cake. I like brownies. I'll have brownies tonight. And uh, I wish, I wish, I really do, that I could just keep eating brownies forever. That would make me happy. But we all know that if I tried to keep eating brownies or cake or anything chocolate forever, then eventually I I would just become sick and the happiness would turn into unhappiness, right? It would turn into sickness. But, But the Greek people looked at their gods and they thought like this. I mean, they probably didn't use cake or brownies. That's just my example. But they looked at the gods and said, those, those people, those gods, they can just keep eating brownies forever without any, any negative return. They have unlimited resources. The brownies never run out. And not only do they have unlimited resources, but they have an unlimited ability and capacity to use those resources. That's different than happiness. Uh, this, is, this is a word that, that refers to, this is how I define it always, internal satisfaction that is not based on our external circumstances. It's not far different than joy, but I think when we think of joy, when we read joy, we we think of something more emotional. This This is saying no matter what I face, no matter what I go through, no matter what I deal with, I'm okay. And in the Bible, it's I'm okay because the work that God has done for me. Mary looks, sings this song, and she says, from this moment forward, from the moment this child has been conceived inside of me, Every generation will call me blessed, will know that no matter what I face, that I'm a satisfied person. From now on, from this moment forward, everything is different for me. I've been taken from a lowly state to a blessed state. In fact, just before this, as, as she comes up, maybe you don't remember this, she comes to her family member, Elizabeth, and, and, and upon seeing Elizabeth, the baby inside of Elizabeth, John, we call him John the Baptist, he leaps for joy in her womb. That's crazy. I don't even know what that feels like. Sounds uncomfortable for the woman. Uh, but, but then she says in a loud voice in Luke 1, 42 through 45, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaps for joy. Blessed is she, blessed is she, who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I mean, did you notice that? Three times she uses this word. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And then Mary, next moment in the story, in the narrative of Luke, the next moment, she says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed all because God has made me pregnant with this child and this child is such a beautiful symbol of how God cares about me and this world now I I just again the circumstances here make this incredible to me because I don't know, when you see Mary in art, right, there's a halo and she's just kind of looking at her baby and I think we, we kind of forget uh, about all the difficult things that she faced as the mother of Jesus. I've already mentioned, you know, a bunch of things that, that after she leaves Elizabeth and Zachariah, she's gonna go back to Joseph and she's gonna have this conversation, right? Like, hey, I'm pregnant. So that's gonna happen. But even beyond that, even beyond those things, I mean, we have to think about how Uh, they're gonna have to move multiple times when Jesus is a baby because because there's threat of death. Uh, His life is in danger and so they move around. Even before he's born, they have to go to Bethlehem. Maybe you know that part of the story. They're riding on a donkey whenever we see it illustrated, right? And they're riding into Bethlehem. That's gonna be really hard as a pregnant woman to travel all those miles. She's gonna give birth in a, a, 
you know, a manger. She's going to lay her baby in the feeding trough. She's going to give birth in a stable, excuse me, and, and put the baby in a manger. I hope she didn't try to give birth in a manger. Uh, but, but these are going to be hard things. At some point, her husband is going to die, and she's going to continue on without him. And then we know the hardest thing that she would ever face. She would watch that baby be nailed to a cross and suffer horribly all for the sins that she had committed and that we have committed. But despite all that, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, she knows that she will be blessed because she will give birth to this child. And we can know, this is so cool, we can know that while we will never give birth, we will never give birth to Jesus, we are invited into his family because of his coming and that means that we are blessed too. The life application commentary says, Mary will be honored from now on by all generations, not because she is special, but because she is the model and representative of what it is to experience God's grace and mercy. I would disagree slightly, I think Mary was special. (laughs) I think she was chosen to do this job because she was special. I think that probably the life application commentary says that in order to not sound too Catholic, right? That Mary was perfect in these things that we don't believe. Mary was special, but she was not perfect. And she had struggles. And the point here that they make is right. She is a model and representative of what it is to experience God's grace and mercy. We we can be called blessed too if we will become servants of God. Luke 60, 20 through 22 says, looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the son of man. No matter what you go through, no matter how hard life is, if you're a servant of God because Jesus came to earth, then you are blessed. That's according to God himself. Uh, but what's interesting is in the rest, man, the rest of the book of Luke basically uses this, is this same word blessed for, for people who follow Jesus, who, for people who are servants of Jesus. And, and I think it, it kind of hits its climax in Luke 20, 11, 27, and 28. As Jesus was saying these things, A woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. That's Mary who's singing this song. And Jesus says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. He's not saying anything bad about his mom here. He's saying that like she was blessed by my coming, you can be blessed by my coming too. It's a crazy verse. I mean, hey, Mary, she's blessed because of what she's done. And Jesus says, well, sure, yeah. But you can be too because I came into this world. Because God looked down from heaven and saw you in your low position, came to earth in the form of Jesus, said, I will live sinlessly. I will die for your sins. I will rise again. Because of that story, if you will give your life to Jesus, if you will give your life to him, then you can be blessed no matter what you face I don't know what you're dealing with this Christmas I don't know what you're struggling with but man the Christmas story should cause you to celebrate why because it means that you can be blessed no matter what you face it means that you have been raised from your low position to a higher position it means that no matter how pressed you've been you from now on from this moment forward can be blessed that's what Christmas is about. That's why Mary sings a song of adoration, a song that magnifies God, a song that proclaims God's greatness in the midst of all the struggle and all the stress and all the worry. It's because she knew that this moment changed everything. It turned her life from pressed to blessed. So, so what do you do? I mean, I, I like to help you do things differently when you leave here and and I, and I thought of a, a couple of things. I think you need to be like John the Baptist mainly. Just, you know, hanging out in his mother's womb. <laughs> John the Baptist, uh, he does two things. 
He does two things in his life. And I don't know if you know his story at all, but he becomes uh, a foundation layer for Jesus' ministry. He teaches, preaches, baptizes people and says, hey, this Messiah is coming. The kingdom is upon you. He's here. And so get ready for that. And, and, and here's what I like about John the Baptist and kind of the two big moments we know from his life. He does two things, and I think they're things that all of us need to do. The first thing that we see about him is that he leaps for joy inside of his mother's womb. And man, I think all of us just need to do a better job of leaping for joy when we consider how the coming of Jesus turns pressed into blessed. We just need to, we just need to be joyful about that. I, I know far too many Christians that just lack joy just don't seem to be excited about the work that God's done for them I'm not asking you to act excited when your loved one has died or when work is terrible or when finances suck right like that's fake but I am saying that we should have generally you know a joyful countenance because we believe that Jesus came and lifted us from our low position to our high position so the first thing John the Baptist does, he leaps for joy. And the second thing that he does is he orients his whole life towards Jesus. All of what he does is geared towards Jesus. People are like, are you the Messiah? No. I'm not even worthy. This is a quote from John the Baptist. I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. And so as you think about the coming of Jesus at Christmas... You need to do two things. Orient your life towards Jesus and be joyful. If you're not a Christian, give your life to Jesus. I don't know where you're at if you've become a servant of Jesus, but if you have not become a servant of Jesus because that's the only way you can go from low to higher. That's the only way that your sinful, struggling life can be a blessed life. Give your life to Jesus. And then live your life for Jesus. And then do your best to celebrate Jesus joyfully because you recognize that he has turned you being pressed into you being blessed. It's it's a moment in history. Christmas is a moment in history that changes everything because God looked down and he saw you. Let me pray that you'll do that. Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming to earth and I don't think I am joyful about it enough, God. I just, I just looked at uh, our calendar uh, the other day, and it was a bad idea because it just raised uh, a level of stress, God, seeing all that we have to do in December. But, but God, in the midst of all of it, I just want to joyfully celebrate you, and I want my life to be oriented towards you, God. I want all that I do, whether it's Christmas parties or, you know, working, whatever, I want it to be all about you and your work and, and celebrating you and Uh, worshiping you and magnifying God you and I pray that that'd be true for me and I pray that it would be true for all of these people in front of me those who are listening online right now God and who will listen online I pray God that if there's people uh, listening to this sermon that have not given their lives to you that have not become their servants I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin now and and that your Holy Spirit would draw them to you God as I pray for people almost every night now God I pray that that you would bring people to you, God, in in the normal ways, like putting Christians around them that will share your gospel with them and invite them to church, but also in supernatural ways like you did with Paul. Bright shining lights or whatever it takes, bring them to you, Lord. And help all of us that already have given our lives to you to live our lives for you and joyfully celebrate you. I pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.